Welcome back everyone to our Faith Formation video series. We're talking about the major events of Jesus and his own life during what we call Holy Week and how we as a church commemorate those major events in our own liturgy of, uh, for Holy Week. Okay, so last time we, uh, we uh, was our third video, we looked at the Last Supper on Holy Thursday. Today we'll look at what happened on Good Friday. So let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the gift of the same Spirit always to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so today we're looking at Good Friday. Multiple things to talk about today. First of all, the name. Why is it called Good Friday? The worst thing ever in human history is what happened on that day. The death of God. And not just the death of God, the murder of God. We, the human race, you know, personified in particular by the Romans and the, and the uh, uh, leaders of the Jews, uh, they, you know, conspired and actually killed Jesus. But really all of us killed Jesus, okay, by our sinfulness, by our sins. So the death of God, the worst thing ever, is what happened on Good Friday. So why do we call it Good Friday? It's because even in the worst of things and through the worst of things, God can make good things happen. So if the very worst thing is what happened, God can make the very best thing happen as a result. So the worst thing that happened was the death of God. The very best thing that happened after that is that for us now, because Jesus died, we don't have to suffer eternal death because of Satan and sin and hell and all that. So the gates of heaven now are flung open for us and we are invited to receive the graces that, that Christ offers to us by virtue of the victory of the cross. And so that's the very best thing, our salvation. Jesus died, so we don't have to. Jesus died and so we are redeemed and we are saved, okay? And we are being saved because we still have to live out this life so we continue to cooperate with that grace to grow in virtue and participate in, in the will of God as, as God wills us to, to live out our lives and proclaim the gospel throughout our lives, okay? But the good thing that happened, the most supreme good, was that our salvation was, was effected. It came about because of that most awful thing, the death of God on the cross. So that is why we call it Good Friday. What else happened, of course, there is, you know, the what Jesus suffered, he was he was arrested the night before, and he started being interrogated already by Caiaphas, the high priest, and his soldiers, and so on. And already he's starting to be, you know, physically abused. They punch him across the face and all this. They spit on him. They slap him and so forth, okay? And then they put him in prison, you know, presumably in, like, uh, solitary confinement, as it were. And interesting, so there is a building in the Holy Land that is where the house of Caiaphas was, it is probably not the house of Caiaphas because now it is a church. But the un underground excavations are as they found them. And you, we got to go down into the lowest part of those dungeons. And the walls of this dungeon are, I think they were like 15 feet high. I mean, not only could Jesus like not reach the, the top of the walls. I mean, it was well beyond his reach, you know, three times his height potentially. Or, you know, all you know certainly more than double his height. So we went down there. And then you know, the whole place could only be lit by, by electric lights, okay? So Jesus was living during this time when there was no electricity. So it would have been a torch light, and then they would have taken the torches away. So he's in utter darkness in this cell. So he's already suffered physical suffering, and that will continue. Now he's suffering like a psychological torture of being in solitary confinement and in utter darkness, okay? And the emotional suffering of being completely isolated, certainly isolated and removed from his mother, from his closest friends, many of whom have already betrayed him. They already fled from, fled from the garden when things got tough. Jesus denied him three times by this point. So he's been not just separated from his friends, but betrayed and denied by them. Okay, so his suffering continues. In the morning, he's brought to, you know, King Herod, who mocks him. He's brought to Pontius Pilate, who, you know, uh, you know, on the surface appears like he's trying to get him, get him freed, but finally caves to, uh, the the to the demands of the mob. By now, they are the mob. They're no longer a, a rational crowd of people. They are acting in a mob mentality, and Pontius Pilate is getting pretty nervous because if this mob mentality 
you know, increases to a kind of a physical fervor, there might be outright rebellion and uprising. And he himself is going to lose his job and maybe even his life because he couldn't control the situation. And so their voices prevailed. Now, I point out that phrase because on Palm Sunday, our celebration of the Lord's Passion on Palm Sunday, the gospel passage, is from St. Luke. And St. Luke is the only one who uses that phrase in the midst of the Passion narrative. Pilate tried to get them to, to, to be, get, get him, Jesus, to be released, but eventually uh, condemned him to death. Because why? Because their voices prevailed, the voices of the crowd. Crucify him. Crucify him. Okay, so Jesus is suffering all of this. He is sent away to be scourged. Now, this is another interesting thing. It says, and then Pontius Pilate had him scourged and then brought back. So he, he had him scourged, like four words, but there's a lot packed in there. It wasn't just like he was punched and roughed up a little bit. He, he was beaten maybe with canes, but with a torture device called the cat of nine tails, which isn't just a whip, but it's a whip with nine ends to it. And the ends weren't just leather, leather straps. The tips of them had iron barbed, you know, hooks at the end of them. So not only was Jesus whipped and it left a welt, but whipped and then the barbs entered his skin and pulling it back now tears his skin. So he is being supremely tortured physically. Cap that off with the crown of thorns and then the more abuse and the spitting and the name calling and the physical abuse. He's brought back to a pilot who who seals the deal, declares him crucified, I guess, or or condemned, and so he's going to be led away to be crucified. Okay, so now we get to the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, the, the Stations of the Cross, as we call them today. And Jesus is given his cross, and he marches across the, the, the through the streets of Jerusalem, which is not a small distance from where the Praetorium is to where he was crucified. Okay, it's a it's a distance. I I believe it was a distance of about a mile, but he's already weak, nearly dead lost a lot of blood and all that, and he's carrying a cross. He's sleep deprived. He hasn't slept in maybe 36 hours at this point. So there's that as well. Supremely dehydrated and all of the rest. Okay, so um, he's dragged, uh, well, he's not dragged at all. He's dragging his cross to the place of Golgotha. There he is crucified. He's put into the ground. Some scriptures, uh, gospels say he was he was crucified at the, uh, at the third hour. That means the third hour after sunrise, so about 9 a.m., and then um, at the sixth hour, darkness covered the earth from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., at which time he died. Other gospel accounts, you know, talk about how he was on the cross only for three hours, not for six. In any event, he was on the cross for a relatively short time. And he and even Pontius Pilate was surprised that he died so quickly. So um, so he dies on the cross and then he is buried. OK, so he truly died. This is God. In his humanity, he truly died. So Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he truly died. Okay, he fully died. There's no, he didn't swoon, he didn't pass out, he didn't do any of that. He died. Okay, we know that because to make sure he's dead, the soldier thrust his spear into his side, and from his side came out blood and water. All right, so the idea is that it pierced not just into his skin, but through the ribs and into the heart. Okay, wrong side, through the heart. Okay. And, uh, and so you can't survive with a heart pierce like that for very long. So if the crucifixion didn't kill him, but he did pass out, the sword thrust is what, what would have killed him. But he was already dead. So this is what happened to Jesus on Good Friday. How we commemorate this liturgically is as follows. Uh, I already mentioned, um, uh, let's see. We already talked about, um, well, we talked about what happened to him in, in the night before. How we do this uh, liturgically Good Friday is the only day of the whole year when Mass is never celebrated anywhere by anyone. There is no Mass on Good Friday. There is Mass the other 364 days a year, but not on Good Friday because Jesus is dead. So it's a, it's a way of depriving ourselves of the graces of the Mass to, uh, to feel as a, in a spiritual sense, maybe more in, a, in an emotional sense as well, that separation from, from God from Jesus, who died, who is dead, okay? So there is no Mass. There's certainly no Mass in the morning. There's nothing in the morning. And then uh, what we do it here at St. Mary is, and during the noon hour, about 1230, 1240, I believe this is open to everyone, but it's, it's, it's for the school too, our Stations of the Cross that day are a living Stations of the Cross put on by our eighth graders. And uh, we started this last year. We're going to continue this tradition where it'll be outdoors in the field. And the, the classrooms are kind of all spread out in a circle. And, 
and we got a podium set up and we're reading the stations and so on. And then the various, the students in their various roles are marching along. They're truly making a Via Della Rosa kind of in this track on the field and acting out each of the stations. So we're doing that at the noon hour, which is traditionally the, you know, what the church has held to be the hour when he's crucified. Okay. And, um, and then in the evening, what the parish does, it's also, so by the way, Good Friday, like Ash Wednesday, is a day of fasting and abstinence. Abstinence from meat, of course, like every Friday in Lent, but fasting as well. So we're depriving ourselves of these comforts because this is, in many ways, the worst thing that could happen. You know, God died, but as I said, the best thing happened through that. But for now, we're entering into that sorrow with Jesus. We're fasting. We don't have the Mass. It is a sorrowful day. Usually, I've found that Good Friday is also a very sunny and relatively warm day, ironically enough. But sometimes it's cold and raining, so we'll see what it does this year. In any event, in the evening, we'll have another prayer service called the Veneration of the Cross. The Veneration of the Cross kind of unfolds like a Mass. But remember what I said in my last video, that Holy Thursday uh, ends without a sign of the cross. It ends without a blessing. That's because it is the first part of a three-part liturgy. Good Friday, the veneration of the cross is the second part of that liturgy. So it does not begin with the sign of the cross, nor does it end with the sign of the cross. It begins simply when the priest and the deacon enter the church. And it simply just ends, it fades out when they leave the church. And so we're wearing red vestments because this is a, the passion of the Lord. Uh, but the altar is bare. There's there's nothing in the you no know, flowers, no not, no decor in the in the sanctuary. The church is as bare as can be to try to emphasize the bareness of the world without the light of Christ. Okay, we have the liturgy of the word. We have the uh, um, the uh, passion narrative proclaimed again, and then we have the veneration of the cross. Truly, mean we're we're going to venerate. We're going to give honor to the cross, this torture device. But Jesus used it to defeat death. So it is a tool now. It is a weapon of the victorious. Okay. So we'll have a large cross in there for people to come and, you know, maybe genuflect before it or place their hand on it or maybe even kiss the cross. And then uh, following that, so we have the liturgy of the word, the veneration of the cross, and then the third part is Holy Communion. What? How can we have Holy Communion if we didn't have a Mass? Well, the evening before, we consecrate enough hosts that we have enough for the Holy Thursday Mass and then the remainder, we have enough to have Holy Communion on Good Friday at the Veneration of the Cross service. So the priest will go to the Chapel of Repose, that kind of sacramental Garden of Gethsemane, and return with the two altar service with candles, uh, preceding him with the ciborium with the, with the hosts. And then we begin Holy Communion. And then uh, the communion that remains is brought back to the Tabernacle of Repose, and there's a final prayer, and then it just ends. And we process out, and that's the end of that. Okay, so that's Good Friday. We got one more video in our series, so please join me again tomorrow as we look at Easter Vigil slash Easter Sunday. Please stay tuned, and God bless you.